Hello beautiful people, my name is Vendi, and over the past couple months I've acquired what I consider to be a lot of books. I really don't know what came over me, especially considering my budget is not exactly massive for books, but through some miracle of accounting and lack of self-control, I've managed to acquire about 25 books over the past two-ish months. So in April and March. Since my birthday is coming up in just about a week, I can expect to have yet more books added to this collection. And since I don't want to do one ginormous haul video that's going to take a million years to film and edit, I figured I would show you my spring book haul and then I'll do a birthday book haul probably sometime later. As it is, there is a lot of books to get through and I'm going to do this sort of formulaically. The first set of books that I'm going to show you are books that you guys have seen on here before that I have done either full reviews on or have closed with in wrap-ups. And then I'm going to go through the books chronologically, so in the order that I got them. For that first round, I'm not going to do much explaining because if you want to know about them, I have reviews up and I'll have them linked in my description box below. But for the rest, I'll give you a brief synopsis if I know anything about it and we'll just sort of move along from there and see how it goes. All right, I hope you are as excited as me to see all of these books stacked up in front of you. So without further ado, let's get into it. So starting with the books that you've already seen before, the first four are ones that I got during a Amazon binge stress buying round. And the first two that I wanna mention from there are The Winner's Crime and The Winner's Kiss, both by Marie Rutkowski. These are books two and three of The Winner's Curse series trilogy. I spoke about them in my April wrap up, so if you wanna know more about them, I suggest checking that video out. The other two books that were part of that binge buying were The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas and The Bells by Danielle Clayton. Hate You Give has obviously been out for over a year now and I figured it was about time to buy it and read it and review it. I also talked about it in my April wrap up and I gave The Bells its own review because it's one of the only four young adult fantasy books written by black women with a black woman as a protagonist in them. And I'm gonna be reading and reviewing all of those. So if you wanna see my full review of The Bells, it's up on my channel as well. After that, I bought one of my most anticipated reads of the year, and that is Children of Blood and Bone by Tomi Adeyemi. This is another one that I have a full review for, and you can check it out, link in the description. Basically, I bought this book because it was one of my most anticipated reads of the year. So the moment it came out, I had to pick it up, and I was lucky enough to get it signed by Tomi as well. And the last book of this first section of books that you've seen on this channel before that I got in a book outlet binge is And I Darken by Kirsten White. I think my review for this just came up. So if you're interested in seeing my thoughts on And I Darken, I recommend you click on my book bay read along review slash vlog. It should have been up either directly before this video or maybe two or three videos before. All right, that is it for the books that you may have seen me talk about before. Now let's get on to the books that you might not have seen mentioned on this channel yet. The first book I wanna talk about is one of the Amazon stress buy books that I got, and that is The Empress by S.J. Kincaid. The Empress is a sequel to The Diabolic, which was one of my favorite reads of last year. In it, we follow Nemesis, who is a Diabolic, and a Diabolic is a person, or not really a person, a being created to serve and protect one single person that they bind to when they are basically children. And that's the Diabolic's entire purpose, just to make sure that this person, their person, stays alive and is healthy and thrives. Basically what happens is that the Emperor of the Universe decides that all Diabolics are dangerous and he calls for all of them to be executed immediately. In order to protect Nemesis, Sidonia, her person, sends her away to pretend to be her in the Emperor's court. So Nemesis is in a really tricky situation because she has to one, pretend to be human, and two, she's a Diabolic now that being a Diabolic is basically illegal. And while she's there, she kind of falls in love with the Emperor's son and shenanigans happen and it's a really good story. I'm pretty sure the Empress picks up right where the Diabolic leaves off and the Diabolic left off on what I thought was like a really good close. I didn't know that there would be a sequel to it, but regardless of that, I'm still really excited to continue on with Nemesis's story because I think it's just a really good one. After that, I went to a book signing as you do when you live in Boston and you're into books and I got Lady Midnight by Cassandra Clare. I had fallen out of love with the Shadowhunter series after reading City of Heavenly Fire, not because it was a bad book, but because I thought I was just done with the Shadowhunter world. And then Emma from Emma Books decided to host a Shadowhunter Chronicles read-along, and I thought, what better way to get back into these books that sort of defined my entire early high school, late middle school existence. So I bought this one so that I could read it, finally, and I'm going to. I still haven't read it yet. 
I don't know what it's about except for that it follows Emma Carstairs, who I think is related to Jem Carstairs from the Infernal Devices, which is my favorite of the Shadowhunter Chronicles series so far. After that, I got Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom, both by Lee Bardugo. Got the cool stained edges, which I really like. I didn't think that they would come with them because I bought a box set and I just assumed that they wouldn't have the stained edges in that, but I was wrong, and I'm really happy that I was wrong about that. I don't know anything about the story except for that it takes place in the Grishaverse, and there's a heist, and there's a lot of characters. And because it's a Lee Bardugo book, I'm pretty sure that I will cry a lot while reading it, and that my soul will be rendered into tiny little pieces. And I'm really excited. Super nervous, but really excited. I think I want to reread the Grisha trilogy before I get into this, but I'm not sure. And then come some more books from that big book outlet haul binge thing that I did. The first ones I want to mention are The Golem's Eye and Ptolemy's Gate, books two and three in the Bartimaeus trilogy by Jonathan Stroud. So I recently read The Ring of Solomon, which is a sort of companion novel to the Bartimaeus trilogy, which is one of my favorite trilogies from when I was a kid. And it made me fall in love with the series all over again. I'd only ever owned the first one, so I figured it was about time to get books two and three. And now I'm planning a reread of all three of them because reading The Ring of Solomon just reminded me how much I love the series in the first place. It follows a demon named Bartimaeus who is a djinn which is a sort of mid-level in power demon. And the way that magic works in this world is that magicians who know demons' names and certain drawings and runes and things to keep themselves protected basically call the djinn from their world into our human world and make them do things. So at the start of the Bartimaeus trilogy, he is called into the world by a very young boy named Nathaniel who wants Bartimaeus' help in humiliating a adult magician who was kind of a huge jerk to Nathaniel when he was little. If that sounds really ridiculously petty to you, it's because it is. That's what magicians are in this world. And Bartimaeus is the most snarkiest of things when dealing with them, and I just love it so much. For being a middle grade, it's a pretty grim story. It's very dark, but there's also a lot of humor to it, which I really love. Anyway, if you like dark humor, and discussions about what it means to be a master or a slave and what it means to be human and magic, I super recommend this series. In that same haul, I got Lyriel and Ab... No, wait a minute. I got Lyriel and Clariel by Garth Nix. These are books two and the prequel to the Sabriel series, or I'm sure it has a real name, but it's the series that starts with Sabriel by Garth Nix. I can't say that I know anything about either of these books, I just know that I've read Sabriel several times and I absolutely love it. The premise of it is basically there's this girl, her name is Sabriel, she's an abhorson, and that means that she has a set of bells which she can use to summon, control, and banish the dead. There are two worlds that are separated by a wall, the very mundane human world and the world where the dead can roam free and there's magic and it's just... I love books that have that as a premise, right, where there's like a thin line of separation between reality and magic and whimsy. I loved it in Neil Gaiman's Stardust. I love it well, basically everywhere. So I'm really excited to get back into this series. I'll definitely have to reread Sabriel before I read Lyriel and probably Clariel as well but I'm really excited to get to it anyway. During that same haul, I also got When Dimple Met Rishi by Sandhya Menon. Like I said in my May TBR, I don't actually know very much about this. I know that there is a romance between a girl named Dimple and a boy named Rishi, and they meet at a IT summer camp, I think, and they might have an arranged marriage thing going on, but I'm not sure. Anyway, it's supposed to be super cute and really fluffy, and that's sort of what I'm in the mood for contemporary-wise, so I'm really glad I picked it up when I saw it for super cheap on Book Outlet. Okay, the last two books that I got in the Book Outlet haul were The Bane Chronicles and Tales from the Shadowhunter Academy by Cassandra Clare and others. I'll hold them up so you can see the other names. So Sarah Reese Brennan and Maureen Johnson seem to appear on both of them. Base ooh. <laughs> Basically, these are two massive novella bind-ups from the Shadow Hunters Chronicles universe. The Bane Chronicles follows Magnus Bane, obviously, and I think his relationship with Alec Lightwood. I don't think that's a spoiler unless you are super behind or you have never read the Shadow Hunter Chronicles, in which case I'm super sorry. Anyway, Magnus is a fan favorite character who I think was originally supposed to be just a side character, but then he got really popular and now Cassie's gonna do his own completely separate trilogy. 
But the Bane Chronicles just follows his romance with Alec, which I think is really sweet. This is another thing that I just didn't read for the Shadowhunter Chronicles. I stuck with the main storyline, so the Mortal Instruments and the Infernal Devices, and I just never picked up any of the novella bind-ups. And the same goes for Tales of Shadowhunter Academy, but even more because it was even bigger, and also because I wasn't the biggest fan of Simon, especially in the first three books of the Mortal Instruments. He's grown on me a lot since then, so during subsequent rereads I started liking him more. But basically what these novels chronicle are Simon's time literally in Shadowhunter Academy. So, spoiler, and when I put my hand down the spoiler's over, at the end of The Mortal Instruments, Simon, I think, stops being a vampire and starts his ascension to becoming a shadow hunter because God forbid anyone stay human in this series. And I think that these stories chronicle that journey. Because it's Simon, I bet this is gonna be like really funny and full of a lot of dry humor, which I think will be a perfect way to sort of get me back into the flow of the Shadow Hunter Chronicles because that was one of my favorite elements to the story. We're in the home stretch now. I separated all these books into separate stacks that I've been bringing over one by one and we're on the last stack finally. So the next three books that I got for all of this were A Court of Thorns and Roses, A Court of Mist and Fury, and I'll give you five bucks if you can guess it but not really because I'm broke, A Court of Wings and Ruin by Sarah J Mass. And I'm gonna put them up there because they're all pretty big. And this one is deceptively heavy because it's full of Bible pages. So if you know this channel, then you know that I am currently hosting volume two of the Book Bay read-along, which is basically just a read-along that I do with my friend Lou over at Books Are A Way Of Life, link in the description. And volume two is a gigantic project called Mass May. So through the entire month of May, we are going to be reading this trilogy, plus A Court of Frost and Starlight by Sarah J Mass because I've never read them and I kind of wanted to try them. So I've tried Sarah J Mass's Throne of Glass, and I didn't like it very much, mostly because Selena infuriated me. I'm still gonna read it, but I probably won't buy it, I'll just borrow it from the library. However, this series, despite my iffiness on Sarah J Mass's writing, has always sort of called to me because A Court of Thorns and Roses is a Beauty and the Beast retelling, which I really, really love, and then A Court of Mist and Fury is a Hades and Persephone retelling, which I'm immediately biased towards. I love Hades and Persephone, and I've yet to find a retelling that really gets to me the way, like, the original story is supposed to. So this trilogy has called to me for those reasons, and also because any story with the Fae immediately draws me in. I am a giant Holly Black fan, and she is the queen of the fairies, if you will. And because of that, I want to try out this series as well. I just finished A Court of Thorns and Roses literally yesterday, and I enjoyed it, fair enough. I definitely had some problems with it, but it was nothing that, you know, wasn't balanced out by some good as well. And I've heard that the other two books absolutely blow it out of the water, so I can't wait to read those as well. I'm not gonna really tell you anything more about them because at the end of May, probably early June, I will be having a gigantic vlog where I give you my thoughts on all three. After that, I spoiled myself and I got myself a copy of The Savior's Champion by Jenna Moresi. The Savior's Champion is the first book in a new dark romantic fantasy series by Jenna Moresi, who is a self-pubbed author and an author tuber right here on YouTube. Link in the description yet again. I've been following her on YouTube for a while and I think she's really funny and great. So when she announced that she was coming out with a fantasy book, I was immediately intrigued and I knew that I was hooked from the moment I read the first three chapters on her website. So the Savior's Champion follows Tobias, who is one of 20 men coming to compete in the Sovereign's Tournament. And the Sovereign's Tournament is basically a competition to see who of these men is the fittest they fight to the death, it's great, and the one left standing, at the end of it all, gets to marry the savior. Now the savior is basically a goddess on earth to the people of Thessin, which is the world that this takes place in. Before the savior came around, Thessin was a barren, desolate, tragic landscape, and her arrival has sort of blessed the land and allowed it to grow fruitful and become rich and beautiful. And each savior gives birth to a daughter who then becomes the next savior and the cycle just continues and continues. So in this round of the Sovereign's Tournament, the new savior needs a husband so that she and her husband can rule over the land. And Tobias enters the tournament because he needs the money that just entering in the tournament gives his family, even in the case that he dies, because his mom and his sister are really not very well off. So Tobias is put through all sorts of horrible trials, he has to see people die, he comes close to dying himself, and all this 
just so he can potentially meet and marry a woman that he's never met. And I just think that's a really cool premise and I can't wait to dive right into this. After that, I got The Book of Separation by Tova Mervis. So The Book of Separation is Tova's memoir about leaving her very, very orthodox Jewish life behind. As a person who has grown up religious and has had many twists and turns and tribulations regarding what religion means to me, I found myself immediately drawn to this book. I came about it because a representative from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt came to one of my publishing classes and she gave out some ARCs and finished copies of books from her department and I snagged this one because I just thought it was really fascinating. I'm not Jewish, I've never been Jewish, I was a born and raised Catholic and now I'm something like that. So this, I hope, will sort of open my eyes as to what it means to be Jewish as well. And obviously one person's story is not representative of everyone's story, but I think that this might take me one step closer to that. Next, I went to Costco with my boyfriend, and because the past three trips to Costco I'd come home without any books, I decided to reward myself by getting two. So I got Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman, the beautiful new paperback with the French flaps and the deckled edges, and it's just stunning. I think Neil Gaiman is an absolutely wonderful author. I love just about everything he's ever written, and I really want to see what he does to make Norse mythology funnier than it already is. I'm a huge fan of mythology of all sorts, so seeing authors take what could be dense and forgettable stories and bring them into modernity like this is just it warms my heart so much, so I owe a lot to authors like Rick Riordan, who brought Greek mythology into the fold of just the general public, and now I'm really delighted that Neil Gaiman's doing the same for the Norse. The second book that I got at Costco was this beautiful edition of Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, both by Lewis Carroll. It's got, like, teal sprayed edges. They're not showing up very well, but this cover is, like, bright pink, and, oh, I gotta show you. It's full of the original illustrations, but in color, and just, oh, I love this story so much. Of all the classics, Peter Pan is my first favorite, and children's classics, obviously, I mean. Peter Pan is my first favorite, and Alice in Wonderland is a pretty close second. I just love the whimsy of these stories and the magic, and that never goes away. It doesn't matter how old you are, when you read those stories, you fall back in love with them, and you feel like everything that they're telling you is possible. Or maybe it's just me, maybe I'm the only one that feels that way. But regardless, I saw this and I couldn't not pick it up. I've always been looking for a bind-up of Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass that wasn't kind of ugly because I'm not a fan of the Barnes & Noble editions. I'm so sorry. And then I found this and it's pink and teal and it's cloth bound, not leather bound. And there's sprayed edges and there's a, a bookmark that's a ribbon. It just, it's stunning. It's beautiful. My other editions of Alice in Wonderland have slowly disappeared over the years, so I will definitely be keeping this one and keeping a close eye on it because I love it very much already and I can't wait to revisit this story. And the final book, book number 25, that I got over recent days, actually I just got it in the mail yesterday, is Heartthrobs, A History of Women and Desire by Carol Diehouse. I won this book in a Goodreads giveaway from Oxford University Press, yes, that Oxford. Female sexuality is a hugely taboo topic. We like to pretend that it isn't there and doesn't exist. And basically, from what I can gather, Heartthrobs takes that idea and is like, hmm, but what if we explored female sexuality and how it's evolved over the years? You may have heard about the male gaze, and I'm pretty sure Heartthrobs takes a look at the female gaze to see what sorts of things women have historically and then up to modernity found most attractive in men. Of course, that's a generalization because not all women are attracted to men, but, I mean, statistically speaking, most women are because otherwise we would not reproduce at the rate that we do. I'm pretty sure this is going to be Western-centered, and I know that standards of beauty and ideals of both masculinity and femininity change and vary widely depending on where you are in the world, but I'm assuming that this is talking about European and then American desires for masculinity. I hope this is also going to explore the way that female sexuality has historically been policed and controlled. Like, it would really not be good if it didn't, because I feel like that's a huge part of female sexuality, is the fact that it has so often been pushed under the bus in favor of the idea of the innocent 
virginal young woman. As it is, I think that this is super exciting and I can't wait to read it and review it for you guys and let you know all about what it was that women were sexualizing throughout all the years. All right, the, the, the army is making me really nervous coming in there behind me. I think that I'm just gonna stack them up and show you what that looks like. So here they are. That is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 books over the past two months. Oh, my poor, poor, poor wallet. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching it. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. And if you like me, maybe consider subscribing. I am pretty great if I do say so myself. Anyway, that is it for me, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I'm going to put these away now, and it's going to be a nightmare. Wish me luck, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.